Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? <laughs> hey, everyone. Take your seats. Hello. I guess I'm not a commanding presence. Oh, there we go. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. This is the fifth installment in the Detroit Future Cities series, Ideas for Innovation. I'm Sarah Hewlett, and I'm the assistant news director at Michigan Radio. I also live here in Detroit with my husband and our two kids. Tonight's discussion is about equitable growth this question of how we create a better Detroit for everyone, not just in the central business district, but out in the neighborhoods where a lot of us live. So in earlier conversations, we've talked about things like what makes a great city, how we define that, how we make that happen, what it takes to build and maintain strong neighborhoods, and what to do with uh, our 20 plus square miles of open space. So tonight our keynote speaker is going to offer his thoughts about what equitable growth means to Detroit. And then we're going to break out into some smaller groups to talk about some of the details, things like who gets included when we talk about growth and how do we expand that and what's the role for neighborhoods and small businesses in that discussion and how do we get people the skills they need to be able to make a living in Detroit. So here to introduce our keynote speaker is the Interim Executive Director of Detroit Future City, Dan Kincaid. starting point, a shared vision, participation, innovation, action. Opportunity for Detroit and all Detroiters. So we, uh, we love this video very much uh, at DFC, uh, and I think many of you have grown to love it if you've been at all of our events. <laughs> Um, it captures the dynamism, the hustle, the struggle, uh, and certainly the spirit of Detroit. Um, it's also really too short. <laughs> um, like it could be about 30 seconds longer, it'd be perfect. Um, but uh, I think it sets the right tone for these kind of events and uh, gives you an idea of just where we're, where we're coming from here. So first off, thank you, Sarah, for the, for the introduction. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you to, to Michigan Radio, uh, the Next Idea Project, as our, as our partner in this uh, process. And a particular thank you to the Knight Foundation for everything they do for us at Detroit Future City, and particularly uh, for this series. Um, we, we also want to, of course, thank you all for being here uh, tonight. Uh, this is a really uh, important night for us in this series. It's, it's, the, it's the fifth event uh, in the Ideas for Innovation series. And as Sarah was is outlining, there are a number of important conversations that have come before this that in many ways uh, have kind of set the stage for the conversation that we're going to have tonight. Uh, it's important to think about I the Ideas for Innovation series uh, in that it's a multifaceted platform. Um, we're looking to integrate important objectives and strategies and actions that emanate from our uh, DFC implementation office uh, and really mesh those with um, critical issues that are imp impacting all of us as Detroiters today. Tonight, of course, our focus is on equitable growth. Uh, and uh, lest I forget, um, I'd just like to uh, encourage everyone to tweet to hashtag DFC ideas. Yes. I'm actually a Luddite, and last uh, two weeks ago, I sent out my first tweet. So I'm really breaking through new ground here. Um, 
So now that we're also on the home stretch somewhat in this series, um, you know, we thought we'd take it easy. Uh, that's why you're seeing a real softball topic like this tonight, right? Uh, and uh, it gets softer from here because the next one, the sixth one, mark your calendars, is uh, October 27th at the DIA, and it will be regionalism. And it doesn't get any easier than that, I think. So, uh, <laughs> but if it, it might, it, it might get complicated. I'm not sure. You should maybe check it out. Um, so. Uh, as you can tell, you know, the conversation tonight is not going to simply be about economic development, right, uh, or, or just growth in general. Uh, for us at DFC, our civic capacity working group, our convening group, uh, this is about surfacing and discussing the ways in which we can recover together, the way we can grow together. It's about how we can create a shared vision for economic growth. It's about ensuring everyone is included in that vision and, and the opportunity that it yields. It's, it's about uh, ensuring that we leverage the facets of our past economy that's still with us uh, while embracing new aspects in economy, uh, new innovation, uh, and, and, and embracing risk in a way that we perhaps have not in the past. It's about looking beyond convention and expedience. This is really important. Uh, to think strategically about focusing employment and residential growth for maximum impact, for maximum impact for all. Uh, that's, a, that's a key point. And quite honestly, it's just, it's about time, right? Uh, it's going to take time to do this, but it's also, there's a, there's a moment here, right? There's a sense of urgency in this. We don't have a lot of time uh, to wait. Um, there's signs of vitality in our city that are becoming visible. Which is, which is great, a more diversified and resilient ecosystem uh, is, is emerging. The value of density uh, is more readily appreciated in our city, and opportunities for growth are drawing near. We must ensure a thoughtful, equitable, and durable uh, direction emerges here. Um, and, and, and in a city like Detroit, this is important where we still have significant concentrations of poverty and we don't have equity at every turn. Uh, and I think, you know, tonight our, our keynote speaker is going to begin to address some of these issues and how we work through them. We're also at a point where investors are certainly looking for certainty, uh, residents are looking for real opportunity, and businesses are looking for support, they're looking for talent, and they're looking for markets. Uh, our keynote speaker tonight operates at the intersection of these lines of desire, and he works tirelessly with his team to ensure uh, more for many. While in many ways Rod Miller, the president and CEO of the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation, needs no introduction, uh, many may find a bit more insight into him and his past to be illuminating. Uh, Rod Miller uh, is a results-oriented leader, as many of you know, uh, with over 10 years of experience in economic development, strategic planning, trade, and foreign investment and project finance. He is respected globally uh, for his ability to maneuver uh, in extraordinary complex political and business environments and craft strategies and structure deals to provide long-term value uh, to communities and investors. Currently, uh, Rod is serving as a president and CEO of DEGC. As CEO, uh, uh, he's firmly committed to enhancing strategies and programs that are aggressive and effective, thoughtful and focused, and that play, in a, that play to the inherent strengths of the local market. Previously, Rod served as the founding president and CEO of the New Orleans Business Alliance. The acronym is the NOLABA, uh, which is big one, yeah, um, uh, the official economic development organization responsible for ensuring long-term economic vitality uh, and driving job growth for the city of New Orleans. In that role, his team was, res was responsible for nearly $900 million in new private sector investment and over 7,500 new jobs. Uh, prior to that position, Rod served as the executive vice president of the Baton Rouge Area Chamber. Uh, where he managed day-to-day -day operations, developed strategic initiatives, and helped to deliver on the firm's $20 million capital campaign. He's held other roles uh, in the public, private, and nonprofit sector. Rod holds a Master of Public Policy from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, a Bachelor of Science degree uh, in International Business from St. Augustine's College, uh, and just for the cherry on top, he uh, also earned a graduate diploma in finance uh, from the Monterey Institute of Technology as a Fulbright Fellow. 
Uh, Rod aims to work collaboratively, yet provide strong leadership, and to continue to communicate a shared path forward. His skills as a negotiator, policy expert, and corporate strategist have been honored in over 10 countries. A scholar, practitioner, uh, he is sought after as a lecturer and contributes to various publications. He uh, is a term member of U.S. Council on Foreign Relations, is a board member in the International Economic Development Council, and sits on the Federal Reserve Board's Community Advisory Council. Rod has received numerous accolades, uh, including uh, Ebony Magazine's 30 Under 30, the Phoenix Business Journal's Top 40 Under 40, the Top 100 Tech Influencers in the Silicon Bayou, Young Economic Developer of the Year by International Economic Development Council, and numerous others. And what I like here is a last point that's really important, is that um, in addition to playing the piano uh, and reading and spending time with his son, which he enjoys to do, uh, Rod is fluent in Spanish and proficient in Portuguese, so feel free to challenge him later tonight with that. Um, and of course, last but not least, Rod is a member of the Detroit Future City Executive Committee. So with that introduction, uh, it is my uh, honor and privilege uh, to introduce to you Rod Miller. Thank you, sir. You got it. You got it. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Can I get a woof woof? All right, we got to have some good energy in here today. So before we get started, I want to I want to know who's in the room. So how many people in the room were born and bred and have lived 90% of their lives in the city of Detroit? Wow. How many, okay, you can take your hands down. That's a, a good portion, almost half, I'd say. How many people here live in the city of Detroit now? All right. How many people work in the city of Detroit now? All right. How many people here live in downtown? All right. How many people live in Midtown? How many people live in Corktown? All right. How many people live on the east side? And how many people live on the west side? All right. So we've got a diverse mix. Now, how many people here um, have never lived or worked in the city of Detroit? All right, we've got a handful of those folks as well. So we've got a pretty diverse group of people from around, and how many people, this is my last question, I think, I think. Um, how many people are not from Detroit and have moved to Detroit in the last five years? Wow, that's amazing. How many people have moved to Detroit in the last three years? Wow, how many have moved in the last two years? How many have moved in the last year? Wow. So, so, so just to get started, Detroit is where it's at. <laughs> Detroit hustles harder. Detroit versus everybody. I say build your dream here. Whatever you want to say, Detroit is the place to be. And, and so I was very honored to ask to, to, to come share some remarks and some thoughts about equitable growth um, to this auspicious group of, of me, uh, community members, business leaders, uh, Detroiters. And uh, at the first thing that I thought about, I said, well, let's talk about what equity actually is. Let me get my clicker here. What is equity? You know, and so it says fairness or justice in the way people are treated. That's a good definition, but what does that really mean when, when we get down to it? Uh, and, and if you see up here, you, you've got all of these animals and, and you know, it's like, okay, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. How many people think that that's fair? That that elephant's going to climb that tree the same way a mo that monkey can climb that tree? No way it can happen. So I'm 6'5", six 6'5", five, six five, and about two, I'm 6'5", I'm 37 years old, and two years ago, I decided to join a basketball league. And it was an over 30 league, which I was very excited about, because I'm like, I'm over 30. So this is great for me. I didn't know, though, that the average age on that, on, of the people out there was going to be about 60. So I was scoring 30 points a game. I was rocking it. And they were running around like this. 
And so it was a, it was a sight, right? But I was blocking shots. And something, something to me said, Rod, <laughs> this probably isn't equitable. This probably isn't fair for your big 6'5", you know, Carolina fed country behind to be out here, you know, knocking all of these old guys around. I mean, I was, I was throwing elbows. I, I thought I was in the NBA. It was awesome for my self-esteem. But it probably wasn't very equitable. And so when we think about equi e equitable, equality is saying that everybody gets a shoe, right? But equity is saying that everyone gets a shoe that fits. And this conversation is vitally important within the context of Detroit. Because I will tell you, everybody in Detroit hasn't always gotten a shoe. Uh, about a year ago when I moved here, I waded into a very, very tense discussion around community benefits. And what I said at that time was, I was not supportive of a community benefits ordinance, but that community benefits were absolutely vital. What people heard was that Rod didn't support community benefits. But let me tell you what, what I've seen and what I've actually come to respect even more. There's a culture, and, uh, and please take this in the spirit that I'm sharing it. There's a culture that I've seen here in the city. Those that have positions of power, influence, be it political, be it business, be it wh whatever, they really don't engage with those that don't. Why? Because I don't have to. And it's kind of like, you know what, I'm going to go take your lunch money, and I'm not going to even try to act like I'm not taking your lunch money, and there's nothing you can do about it. Detroiters should be mad, should be irate. Everyone should be irate. It's absolutely unacceptable that we have um, projects, and we have companies, and we have those that come to the city supposedly to be a part of the revitalization of the city that actually don't actually want to be a part of the revitalization of the city. It's absolutely, completely unfair that those that receive benefits from the city, whether those are incentives or other things, are not asked or not required to participate in investing in the city in the long term uh, in the long-term growth of where the city's going. And there are ways that we can get there, and that's a conversation we can, I'll, we, can put a, we can put a pin in that and we can talk more about it later. But, you know, there is a reason for people to be mad. But what I've learned is that when you don't engage people and you don't have those conversations, ultimately people can draw their own conclusions. I've heard the craziest conspiracy theories since I've been in Detroit. They should be, they should be like a, a movie or something because some of the ideas around what people think is happening behind the scenes are not grounded in anything that's absolutely, that's, that's true at all. But when you don't engage and you don't have the conversation and you don't provide people with a respectful seat at the table, you don't, you don't get the results you want and that allows folks to make their own calls about where things are going. So when I think about equity, it's a shoe that fits, right? And what is a shoe that fits that looks like? And, what, and what, what can and what should people expect from government, from nonprofits, from business leaders, from their communities? There's, you know, there's the basic needs of food, water, shelter, and clothing. I mean, when we think about it within the, the terms of Maslow, it would be, you know, the physiological needs that we just talked about being at the bottom, but that's the bare, that's the bare minimum. And those are things that I believe that people, as a, as a, a, a right, of being born, you should have an opportunity to live. And ide ideally, you know, that idea of self-actualization is a great idea. I don't know that you have a right to self-actualization, but I think you have a right to water. You have a right to food. And talking about equity within the context of Detroit, how do we create an environment that allows for everyone to have an opportunity to participate? Everyone doesn't have to participate in the economic expansion. That's not, that's not a mandate. But there has to be an inroad that is fair, that is just, that recognizes the diverse skills and the diverse talents and the diverse abilities that different people bring to the table. Looking at that initial picture where we talked, where, talk, where it was all the animals climbing the tree, that there was no way that elephant was going to climb the tree. 
But there are some things that elephant could do that that monkey could never imagine doing. So how do we really start to value the skills of what everyone brings to the marketplace? This equity conversation is not only past due, it's very, very relevant. When we look at child poverty in the city, you're talking about nearly 60% of the kids in the city living in poverty. That's unacceptable. And those indicators around economic justice and economic well-being, they play out in everything in life. From a kid's ability to learn, to the reality that the average uh, life expectancy in gross point is 90, and in Brightmore it's 55. That's not right. When we look at Detroit, when we look at less than high school equivalency, it's twice Michigan's average. When we look at household income, it's almost half of what the US average is. When we look at unemployment, it's, it's, it's twice of what Michigan's average is and almost three times what the US's unemployment rates are. That is not a way to live. That's not a way to build a strong, healthy, sustainable economy. And I would posit that no one, no business, that our economy overall cannot be healthy with these kinds of statistics. These kinds of statistics are very clear in terms of the disparities in terms of performance that we have in the city of Detroit versus the rest of the country. Uh, you know, this population shift from the city to the region, when we look at 1950, where we were almost 2 million people, and now we're down to under 700,000. Even with the blank slate of bankruptcy, there's no way that 700,000 mostly poor people can afford to support an infrastructure that was built for 2 million people. These are tremendous challenges. And then when you look at the growth that's happened in the suburbs, and I, you know, I tell my friends in Oakland and, and Macomb and other places in other parts of the region all the time, you can't really prosper without a strong city. That's a fundamental uh, principle of urban planning, that you've got to have a strong urban core for the rest of the region to thrive. It's not just a Detroit problem, it's a global problem. When we look at the US income gap, 894 people in the US make more than $20 million a year, whereas we've got 81.7 million people that make less than $30,000 a year. In other words, most folks, what we would say in South Carolina, most folks are poor. I'm letting that sink in just a minute. If the US were divided, if, if US land were divided like US wealth, 1% would own more than a quarter of the country. The 9% would own another quarter of the country. Actually, that's really more than half. So you see 10% of the population of the country would own most of the country. How can we say we're the land of the free and the home of the brave? With these kind of statistics, when we see the kind of poverty, and it's not just a Detroit problem, it's a national problem, and it's a global problem. You know, when we look at the global wealth pyramid, I mean, this is a very, very telling, telling uh, uh, data point as well. The global wealth pyramid, what that shows is that 10%, less than 10%, about 8% of the uh, population of the world 8% of the population of the world has, what percentage of resources is it here? 83% of the wealth of the world. 91.6% of the adult population only controls 17% of the world's wealth. So 91% of the adult population only controls 17% of the world's wealth. So how is it that we're all supposed to make a better life for ourselves and for our children when these gaps are so pronounced. And what this chart underscores is that, unfortunately, most of the world, <laughs> most of the world has less income inequality than we do. Other than, the places in red are the only places where there are bigger gaps in wealth. So the rest of the world pretty much has this problem, but the US has it worse. How many people are surprised by that? That the income gaps in the US are worse than they are around most of the other places around the world? Anybody surprised by that? I mean, I've always grown up to think, we're the US, we got money, we're doing well, you know? 
And what this says is, maybe, maybe not. I mean, this issue of social justice and economic uh, disparity has become such a, a big issue that even now the Pope is talking about it a lot. It's very rare that the Pope gives a speech now where he doesn't talk about economic justice. Now, how many folks, how many people were anticipating that this is what I would talk about? Let's see. So people, are people surprised a little bit that this is what? You anticipated. Why did you anticipate it? This is what you teach. Where do you teach? And, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So the professor there, I'm sure she could give you a lot more statistics. It was hard for me to whittle it down because of how stark the problems are. And unfortunately, there is a, a thinking that, you know, that those that are business people don't care about these issues or that there's a business orientation that, that flies counter to this. Actually, it's the exact opposite for those business leaders that are savvy. Because we know that the number one driver of profitability of businesses is what? Who knows? What's the number one driver of the profitability of businesses? Anybody knows? People. People is what determines how, how well businesses do. And so if people are not able to live, if they're not able to thrive, if they're not able to have opportunity or see a brighter future for themselves or for others, the businesses will never realize those profits. And so the reality is we can't solve the problems of today by using the same kind of thinking we use to create them. And so there are some key principles that I think we have to think about. Number one, everybody deserves a right, has a right, to participate in economic expansion. Now, let me be clear about what I'm saying. I'm not suggesting a welfare state by any stretch of the imagination. But what I'm suggesting is that one should have an opportunity to compete, and that ability to compete shouldn't be based on where you were born, what color your skin is, how wealthy your parents are. Your opportunity to compete should be based on what skills do you bring to the table? How hard are you willing to work? What uh, opportunities are you willing to take advantage of? But we've got to create the appropriate avenues so that people have an opportunity to participate in our economic expansion as a country and as a market. We've got to adjust to a changing global market. What do I mean? Well. Gone are the days. So 50 years ago, if you were born a white male in the US, you were guaranteed pretty much a certain lifestyle. You were guaranteed a certain level of affluence just by being born white and being born a male in this country. It's the reality. Um, the statistics show that it's, uh, it's not chance. So if you were born uh, 100 years ago in the US, as a white male, things look pretty good for you. Today, what we see, we're in the post-Cold War era, so we no longer have this, you know, USSR, USA kind of two big frameworks where, you know, you're either in one bucket or you're in the other. We've got a much more nimble, a much more volatile global economy where uh, young kids in rural parts of India and rural parts of Africa, rural parts of the world can compete and get the same kind of education that I got out at Harvard from, a, from a, a, a tablet notebook. We're in a world where the highest growth in terms of markets around the country now is no longer in Europe or the US. The highest levels of growth now are in Asia and Africa. So the most money to be made are in those emerging markets. What does that mean? That means volatility for the US. You know, so that means that the US doesn't have this hegemonic position that we once had where it was clear that if there was a fight, an economic fight, we were going to win it. So we've got to think about building our economy and building our community in a way that says, okay, people get to have to, we have to let every, everyone has to have a seat at the table or has the right to a seat at the table. We've got to recognize, recognize the global risk, uh, the global challenges, the global opportunities. 
and what that means from a competitive standpoint. So what, where's the nature of competition as it relates to business? We've got to remember best practices. So whether or not the things that we've done have always worked, we've got to remember what's worked, what hasn't worked, how it's worked. And as we innovate, we've got to build our innovation off of some, some commonly held principles around economics, around urban planning, so on and so forth. So it's not about a blank slate, it's about recognizing what's been done and how do we innovate and improve upon that. These are some key principles that I'd like for you to keep in mind. So after looking at those statistics, those, those, those figures can be quite depressing. The question is, what do we do now? Because I, I would argue that there is a moral imperative to do something, but I'd also argue that it's an economic imperative. And the moral imperative is it's the right thing to do, right? People should have opportunities. But the economic imperative is that if we don't create these opportunities, if we don't build out our community uh, from an urban planning land use or from these different perspectives, if we don't put tools in the hands of people, if we don't do these things, I would argue that we're looking at economic failure not only as a community, but as a city, as a state, as a region, as a country. So we have to move forward in a manner that allows us to keep these principles in mind, but that also focuses on the built environment, inclusive economic development, and putting tools in the hands of the people. The built environment, you are my density. How do we connect people? Uh, so what we know is that Detroit actually has the largest gap in the country between where people live and where they work. And we found that only 22% of jobs in the region are accessible within 90 minutes through public transportation. Hmm. The built environment. We've got to connect people. We've got to connect place. Uh, we've got to make sure that people have access to basic human needs. In other words, as we think about placemaking, the idea is that the more that we can allow for people to live where they work and have amenities where they live, um, the more time that people will have with their families, the higher the quality of life will be, the less congestion that we'll have. How should, and, and this is what's really exciting about Detroit. Because of the level of, of divestment, and the quality and the, and the, and the um, caliber and quantity and scale of the infrastructure that we have here, we actually have an opportunity to build the city of the future. Build the city of the future. Yes, that's worth clapping. We have an opportunity to build the city of the future. And I'm going to go off script for just a minute and share what I think the city of the future looks like if we're smart. The city of the future is a city, it's not a city where everyone necessarily goes to college, but where everyone has access to training, has access to education. Everyone has access to world-class education for whatever it is that you want to do. World-class education doesn't necessarily mean academic training. It could be academic training. It could be uh, the maker movement, learning how to make things. It could be uh, logistics training. The city of the future is a city where people can learn. It's a learning community. What else do I think about when I think about the city of the future? I remember the most important factor in driving profitability for companies is what? People. So the city of the future is a city where people are healthy, where people have access to world-class health care. That's vitally important. World-class health care, that's so important. And it's not just reactive and responsive health care, it's preventative health care. It's health care that stops people from being sick. The city of the future is thinking about those things. The city of the future, remember that principle that said we got to remember the global marketplace? The city of the future is an open community that accepts people from anywhere in the world and says, you know what, if you're about the D, we want you here because we know that working together will get more done than being apart. The city of the future is a place where people are connected not only physically but also connected um, virtually. 
So my kid can go online and learn from somebody in, in Sri Lanka. You know, my little boy, he's nine. Right now, he thinks he wants to be a chef, right? Wouldn't it be cool if Detroit was a place where we had the kind of connectivity to global, global markets where he could go online and learn from, from a chef in, uh, in Sao Paulo how to make a feijoada? I mean, that's what the city of the future looks like. The city of the future is a place that makes sure that people that have been there for the last 50 years aren't left behind aren't cut out of conversations about where development goes. That's what the city of the future looks like. It's not just about new and fresh. It's about res not just respect, but paying homage to the great history that the city has had. Yesterday, we released an RFP for Paradise Valley. In Paradise Valley, Harmony Park area, we own five buildings over there and two parking lots. Par Paradise Valley was an area in the early 20th century here in Detroit where many, it was the only place where African Americans could live and, and many of the people that moved there had moved from parts of the south. And Paradise Valley at its peak had over 300 African American businesses. And, and there was a question that was posed to me and it said, Rod, you know, you guys are doing this thing and you're calling it Paradise Valley because where we're looking at this project it isn't actually where Paradise Valley once was. So why are you doing this? And is this trying to celebrate a time in our history when we were divided, a time when we were segregated? I said, absolutely not. Let me tell you what this is about. When we go back to that era, even though there were 300 African American businesses there, pharmacies, salons, restaurants, grocery stores. It was the happening place. It was a place where people of all cultures came together to listen to some good, some good music and get some good food. Uh, it was a place that was vibrant, that was a destination location. So in this re relaunch of Paradise Valley, Paradise Valley 2.0, our goal was to celebrate the great history that was in this place that was Paradise Valley before, but recognize the opportunity that we have ahead of us to embrace cultures, to have inclusive economic development, to have local ownership. All of these things were important pieces of what made Paradise Valley uh, so, so important. So we've got, a, we've got an opportunity to build the city of the future here, and the city of the future is a great place. And I would argue that there is no other place in the US that has the kind of opportunity that we have here. So when I think about that, you know, how our cities are shake, shaping us, there is a real opportunity for us to um, be thoughtful about how we live better, and, and a big piece of that is how we leverage land and other assets. Uh, putting this, kind of bringing it from that level, bringing it all the way down. I-94, uh, I-94 Industrial Park, Mount Elliott Corridor. Um, if we go up that area, right now we got 600 grand from the federal government to explore how do we create a logistics and manufacturing center. And despite all of the land that we have in the city, it's very, very difficult. So if I got a call from a company tomorrow that said, I need 100 acres and we're going to create 40,000 jobs, which realistically that could happen. Um, and just so you know, just to give you more context, when you look at manufacturing, uh, the largest manufacturing inwards investments tend to be foreign direct investments. So these tend to be foreign companies. And the average wage of these foreign companies that invest in the U.S. is about $80,000 a year. And, and the reason why they come to the U.S. is because of what? What's that number one thing I said? They come here because of talent. So they come here because of people, and they come here because we buy everything, right? So. Realistically, I could get a call tomorrow that says, hey, Rod, I need 100 acres. We're going to create tens of thousands of jobs. Where would we put it? There is no place in the city that has 100 contiguous acres under single management where we could easily do a deal. And in the motor city, in a manufacturing city, a city that knows how to make things, that just doesn't work. So being thoughtful about placemaking. How do we do work on uh, Mount Elliott Corridor, I-94 Industrial Park, that area that creates opportunities for businesses and, and to create um, jo a job center for the region? Um, Paradise Valley, I already spoke a little bit to that. Southwest Detroit. Southwest Detroit is very, very funky. I like Southwest. I have a Southwest Detroit, Detroit bias a little bit, so I'll just share that. Because I used to live in Mexico, they used to call me the Blacksican. 
I would walk down the street and people would be like, Negro, Mexico loves you. Um, but I go to Southwest Detroit and it not only reminds me of that, but it's the energy that's there. It's the energy, you know, when I go get my tres leches cake, or it's the energy when I go get my tacos, or it's the fact that I see a level of pride that people in Southwest Detroit have about taking care of their neighborhood and taking care of the, the houses where they live or where they, they might have lived for generations. And, uh, but right now we've got a qu big question with Southwest Detroit, right? Okay, so we've got this bridge that's coming in. And in full disclosure, we were recently asked at the DGC to manage, uh, serve as kind of uh, owner's rep and kind of help manage the construction of that bridge. Now, this is an opportunity and a challenge, right? Because how many people, just out of curiosity, are supportive of the new bridge coming in? The, the, the one by the state, that the state and the Canadian government is doing. How many people are supportive of it? All right. About half the room. How many aren't supportive of it? It's okay. Don't be afraid. <laughs> and, and so let me tell you my position. One is that, so when we look at the level of traffic, this is another one of those things that's a Detroit competitive position thing, right? Detroit is the largest city on the border of Canada. Largest city. We're a major international logistics hub. And now when we look at the ways that we're connected, there isn't sufficient capacity. So there's a need for this bridge. Now, thinking about equitable development and what me, what's the right thing to do. So I wasn't here, so I'm going, to, I'm going to extrapolate and make some guesses. And you can tell me I'm wrong. Maybe what happened was that there was a real robust conversation with community about what they wanted and how it should work and so on and so forth. But based on what I've seen in the time that I've been here, I'm guessing that some folks said, we control this property, this is the right thing to do, we're gonna do it and move forward. That's my guess. Now, what do we do at this point? Because the reality is the bridge is coming and it's quite frankly, it's needed. Um, we've got dollars to help relocate some businesses. We've got dollars to help move some, so help families move to some other places. But what I can guarantee you at this point with the DGC as we manage this project, we're going to have really in-depth conversations with community. We want to understand what people's real needs are. Because quite frankly, a lot of times, the things that we think or people's issues aren't their issues, it's something else. It might be something easily manageable. And what we'll do is in the cases where we can fix it, we will. In the cases where we can't, we won't. But we will be honest and we will have that conversation because at a minimum, people deserve respect. This is the opportunity that we have in front of us with building the future of the city. Economic development is the second major, major uh, area. So we got sense of place, and then we've got economic development. So it's about job attraction and retention. 80% of an economy's growth come from businesses that are already there. So we meet with about 200 businesses a year right now to try and figure out how to help them be sustainable and grow in the city. I'd love to see us boost that to more like 400, and then another three to 400 uh, uh, via surveys and that kind of thing. But 80% of an economy's growth through companies that are already there. Attraction. Historically, the Detroit in the last, from what I can tell in the last 20 to 30 years, hasn't been very aggressive in selling the Detroit story. There is a great story there to tell. In the last month, me and my team, we've been to Chicago, we've been to New York, we've been to Dallas, meeting with companies, meeting with investors, and everybody wants to be here. And what's interesting about it, they want to be here and they don't even know what here is. They're like, I don't know, but something cool is happening in the D. So we got to go out and sell our, we got to go out and sell our market. There are four areas that we're, we're focused on. Advanced manuf manufacturing, because um, we've made stuff before and we'll make stuff again and we continue to make stuff and that's really an opportunity. Um, innovation, uh, that's software development, it's food. There's been over 600 million in food investments made in the region over the last four or five years. So there's some big opportunities in food for us to serve as a food uh, center. Transportation, distribution, and logistics. We have more miles of highway than any other place in the country. We've got a port. We've got a great international airport. We've got a city airport. Um, and professional services. At the end of the day, when you have all these businesses, they need lawyers, they need accountants, they need other support services. Um, but in order for us to really do economic development well, we got to remember what was the 
what was the most important thing in driving um, business decisions? What was it? People. So at the end of the day, if local people can't have access to those jobs, we're not going to be successful. So we've got to focus on training. How do we, how do we transform our education system so that it's not just functional, but that it actually works? So that when young people graduate from high school, they've got skills to either go into some sort of job, to go to some sort of community college or technical college, or they've got skills where they, where they can go, go off to a four-year school. Whatever the option is, there's not a right or wrong option, but you've got to have options. And when you've got kids in ninth and 10th grade that can't read at a third grade level, and you've got kids in 12th grade that are graduating that can't read at an eighth grade level, that is a recipe for failure. Remember 59% of kids living in poverty? That's going to replicate that process over and over again. So we've got to fix education. We've got to, uh, we've got to be thoughtful as we bring in those advanced manufacturing, innovation, transportation, uh, log logistics, and professional services company. We've got to make sure that our training and workforce programs align with that and with where those industries are headed. As we think about uh, the built environment, as we talked about on the last slide, as we think about our real estate plans, we need to build out our real estate plan so that it can comply and can actually meet the needs of these industry sectors. We've got to have a transportation system that's robust so that people can get to jobs, people can get to services, healthy people. Healthy people is important. People with fresh food, all of those things are important. That's what equity is all about, that people have access to resources and that we can move goods and services because if you make stuff but you can't get it to anybody, it's not really any good that you make stuff. So, and then last but not least, entrepreneurship and cultivating small businesses. It's much more likely, quite frankly. I mean, this was a good week. We had Lear, the new announcement of Lear, new facilities in the city. We had Amazon's new announcement in the city. And I'm, and I'm telling you, we're, we're hustling. There's going to be some other big announcement. But you're much more likely, we are much more likely to build an Amazon, to build a Google, than we are to uproot it from Palo Alto and move it to Detroit. But we've got to have an innovation ecosystem that supports that. We don't have that right now. So we've got to go move in that direction. And then on the small business side, we've got very high incarceration rates. We've got a lot of returning citizens. And, and what we know is that neighborhood groups are much more likely, neighborhood businesses are much more likely to hire those people, to hire those returning citizens than someone else. And many of those returning citizens have their own skill sets and have their own abilities that you know dwarf so, another story. About, I, I used to be married, I'm single. And my wife hated that I did not like to do stuff around the house. I suck. I would build stuff, it would be leaning to the side like that. And I remember one particular day, I felt like, I felt like this was a good, this was a good, you know, in the, in the man-woman kind of, kind of balancing act. This was a good experience. So it was my wife and her mother and this guy, we had called him a handyman. We'd call him to come and, and do this work. And he was doing this work and he was doing it. It was amazing work. He was also a returning citizen, which we didn't know. And um, through the work, halfway through the work, my ex-wife and her mother, they just start ragging on me. Oh, Rod, you suck. You can't build anything. And da 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 They were just giving me this hard time. And the guy turns to them and he says, I'm so glad that he can't build anything because if he had this ability, I wouldn't have this job. That spoke volumes to me. That spoke volumes to me because this was somebody who, through the natural eye, people would say, well, Rod went to Harvard and this is a convicted felon. So what can Rod learn from this convicted felon? Well, quite frankly, this gentleman had a robust skill set, but if I had that skill set and I had done that work, he wouldn't have had a job. And if he wasn't on his own doing that job, he wouldn't have had a job. So we've got to make sure that we have a, an entrepreneurial and, and small business ecosystem that supports that. How do we do that? We've got to put the tools in the hands of people. And I'm almost done. So when I think about Detroit Future City, and they probably don't even have it here today. When I think about Detroit Future City, Detroit Future City is so important because Detroit Future City really ties together this land use planning access, uh, aspect with, with economic development, with community engagement, with government. 
So it really kind of serves as a thread pulling all of these things together in a way that very few organizations can. And what Detroit Future City has done, uh, and when I say put tools in the hands of people, they just develop. Is it public yet, the, uh, the, the side lot plant stuff? Oh my gosh, they got like 100 different books. And I don't have a green thumb, but they have these books for how do you beautify side lots. But these are tools in the hands of people. You can pick up the book. It says, this is how you can design out the side lot. This is what kind of plants make sense. This is, you know, you got to put tools in the hands of people. When I look at the DGC, we've got a, an array of small business programs. We've got the D2D program. We've got 17 major uh, companies, 17 anchor companies that we're working with. And we've grown the spend from $550 million three years ago to over $925 million in a day. And, and, and so in other words, we've created opportunities by, you know, uh, through these pro sessions and through asking big business, if we were able to find a local business that were able to provide that same service that you're buying elsewhere and provide it at the same quality, at the same price, would you consider it? They said yes. That's putting the tools in the hands of, of people. When we look at government, the, the city government side lot program that allows people that in the neighborhood to buy the lot beside them that they might have been taken care of, that's putting tools in the hands of people. That's something that we've failed on historically in the city, but I think we're starting to get it now. You gotta put tools in the hands of people. Businesses have to be engaged, neighborhoods have to be engaged, and this has to be an ongoing dialogue, not just for special occasions. The solution to adult problems tomorrow depends in large measure upon how our children grow up today. And I would argue that if we don't focus on the built environment, if we don't focus on economic development, if we don't focus on putting the tools in the hands of the people, we're gonna see those statistics get even worse. Um, thank you so much, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thanks, Rod. I was not expecting that presentation. It was refreshing to hear a conversation about economic development that reflects the realities that uh, we are all living with here in the city. So we actually, we don't have time for a Q&A. We're um, running short on time, so we're gonna go right into the breakout sessions. Um, so we have the role of place in equitable growth that's the Detroit Quarter Initiative. It's going to lead a discussion on the importance of inclusive growth, present research on how Detroit's neighborhoods measure up, and discuss different place-based strategies for inclusive growth. The second one is resources to grow your neighborhood business. That's SWAT City, Prosperous, and the City of Detroit. They're going to give an overview of the resources that are available in Detroit to grow your small business with a focus on new initiatives being launched by the city of Detroit. Those two sessions are downstairs in classrooms one and two. The third uh, breakout group, Building an Equitable Workforce, is gonna be right here with me. Um, that's gonna be a panel discussion about increasing access and removing barriers to growing industries. So you can stay right here if that's the one you'd like to be in. Thanks everybody for coming tonight. Thank you.